Hello everyone, this hour on Verbling, the next in my great short story series. We're in the second hour of short stories number 12, Two Stories by Leonora Carrington. In the last class, we read The Debutante. We're going to be discussing that, and then we'll read a second short story, What Rabbits, in just a minute. So that's a bit about the class. Here's a bit about me. I'm John Eric your verbling teacher for this hour, and I'm an American teacher from New York, hanging out from Lisbon, Portugal, to bring you this class. By the way, here are three quick rules to help you participate. Don't forget to turn off... Whoops, there we go. Don't forget to turn off, tune in, and open up. That means turn off your microphone when you're not speaking so we can keep the classroom quiet. Tune in to the new vocabulary you learn and use it actively so that I can correct you. And finally, open up to your classmates. Relax and have fun. We're all here to learn and this is a safe and respectful place to practice your English. So we're going to get started in just a second. What I'm going to do is share my screen with you so that you can uh, have a copy of the text on screen. Last class, it seems to have broken, but I think I fixed it. I think I did. Let's see. And I'll also give you the link so that you can open this directly in your, in your browser in just a second, if I can get everything to work. Hmm. Okay. I don't see where it is. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me do this. First, let me get my identification on screen before we begin. Give me just a second to copy and paste that. And then we'll get started. So hopefully that will work. Let's see. Is it working? Yes, it's working. Very good. OK, so now you can see me. And what I'm going to do is put the links from the last class in the chat window. I'll open them as well if it lets me. <sighs> the links were erased. Wonderful. How did that happen? Hang on just a second. I'm going to copy and paste these for you in just a second here. Copy link location. OK, so <clears throat> here's the deal. In the chat window right now, you should have a copy of our shared stories document. There we go. It's opening now. OK. Sorry about that. But for some reason, the links got erased. So I had to copy them uh, right now. But I think they're there. And while that's downloading, what we're going to do is just a quick, quick summary of the last story. We'll talk about it for a minute. And then we'll read the second one, and we'll have a fuller discussion where we compare the two together. In the last class, we talked a bit about surrealism and about uh, some key words that might be important to think about. So the first thing I'd like to do is to go back to that painting we looked at. And I'll, I'll show it on screen again in just a second. To go back to that painting, and I asked you to think about those key words and the feeling you got from the painting. And maybe we can use that as a way to start talking about the story that we read. So if you give me just a minute to reopen my material. Give me just a second, because I've got to share the screen with you for this. Hold on a second. Uh, where was it? Hang on just a minute, and we'll get started. Sorry about this. It's a little bit slow. All right. I think I got it now. OK. Yep, got it. So what I'm going to do first this lets me 
Okay, it's now everything's reloading again. Once again, I'm out of control. Okay, when my Google stop reloading, here's what we're going to do. The ending of the last story came up pretty abruptly. So what I want to do before we do anything else is just go to the ending because I want to make sure it's clear what happened. So, because it it took it took me by surprise, so I imagine it might have taken you by surprise as well. Okay, so I'm trying very hard to scroll down through the document. Give me just a second here to get to page four. Okay, yeah, this is it, this is it. Okay, I just want to read the last part again because the ending came up pretty quickly. So, in this story, a young girl who's going to be, uh, she's going to go to a ball in her honor. That's like a fancy dressed party, a dance in her honor. She's a debutante. She's going to be presented to society. But she detests dancing. She hates dancing. So, since she spent the afternoons at the zoo and befriended a hyena, she and the hyena decide that they have a plan. The hyena will go in her place. So we read the story and we discovered that the hyena had some ideas of her own. The hyena decided to kill the maid and put the maid's face on her face, <clears throat> dress up like the girl, and that she could pass herself off for the debutante. I just want to read the end of the story because the beginning happens and then it cuts right to the end, <laughs> which is a little bit disconcerting. So follow along on screen. I'm just going to read the last part here. Hold on just a second. Make sure I got the right part. Yeah, yeah this is it. Okay. So follow along. At the very end of the story, um, so the hyena is in her room and she's killed the maid. So that part we read together. But then look at this ending here. At last, she turned around. Turn around now and look beautiful. I <clears throat> Look, because I am beautiful. Before the mirror, the hyena admired herself in, in Marie's face. So the hyena is wearing the maid's face. She had eaten very carefully all around the face so that what was left was just what was needed. Surely it's done properly, said I. Now the story takes a strange cut. It cuts forward in time here, but it doesn't really let us know. We just kind of figure it out. In the next paragraph, toward evening, when the hyena was all dressed, she declared, I am in a very good mood. I have the impression that I will be a great success this evening. When the music below had been heard for some time, I said to her, go now, and remember not to place yourself at my mother's side. She will surely know that it is not I. Otherwise, I know no one. Good luck. I embraced her as we parted, but she smelled very strong. Well, <laughs> hyenas have a strong smell. Now we cut forward again in time, and there's no indication of that in the text. We just figure it out from reading. So we cut forward again. Night had fallen. Exhausted by the emotions of the day, I took a book and sat down by the open window. I remember that I was reading Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. It was perhaps an hour later that the first sign of misfortune announced itself. A bat entered through the window, emitting little cries. I am terribly afraid of bats. I hid behind a chair, my teeth chattering. Scarcely was a one of the... Scarcely was I on my knees when the beating of the wings was drowned out by a great commotion at the door. My mother entered, pale with rage. We were coming to seat ourselves at the table, she said, when the thing who was in your place rose and cried, I smell a little strong, huh? Well, as for me, I do not eat cake. And with these words, she removed her face and ate it. A great leap, and she disappeared out the window. And that was the story of the debutante. Uh, 
is that what you expected to happen in the story? For those of you who are in the last hour, <laughs> is that is that the ending that you were expecting? I I thought uh, I thought it turned uh, it would turn turn it would turn out to turn out to unsuccessful <laughs> because it is very um, very very. <laughs> Uh, um, um, not so planned. Uh, it was very, it was very unplanned. Unplanned. Very spontaneous. Yes, spontaneous. So, and the character of the hyena is uh, not so careful. So, it is quite. It is not surprising that uh, the ending. Is, uh, it turned out such an ending. And, and also, what about the normal parts of a story, beginning, middle, and end? The surprising thing for me was that the beginning of the story is like 80% of the story. And then there appears to be no middle. And then the ending is like the last 20%, the last two paragraphs. Not even, really just the last paragraph. So it's like a story with no middle. Uh, did that shock anyone else? I think it's because the protagonist of this story it, uh, it's uh, not a hyena, but uh, a girl. I think uh, uh, the main point of this story is uh, descri describing the feeling of a teenager. It is, the, it is good that the protagonist of this story is uh, not an adult girl, a uh, teenager. A uh, teenager has a very subtle feeling. Uh, it uh, uh, or um, teenager also often has a rebellious stage. Rebellious <laughs> so, stage. Rebellious, right. yes. So and uh, she's uh, 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 protagonist of this story is uh, this girl is uh, naive. It seems naive uh, firstly, but it turned out quite cru cruel. cruel. Uh, she is not. Uh, she is quite uh, an indifferent about uh, killing uh, the maid Marie, uh, and she, mm, she, she, she much. She she love more to to hyena than than uh, than she, than her surrounding surrounding people. That's right. So, and let me ask you a question. Um, Remember that picture we looked at in the beginning of the last class, the, the painting by Magritte. Do you remember that? If you do, if you don't, I'll put it on screen again. I'd like you to take a second look at it. Hold on one second here. Got to go into my folder. One second. Uh, where did I put it? <laughs> if I can't find it, I'm going to... Okay, I can't find it. Never mind. Let me go back to my... Oh, where are my links? I want to show you this picture again because I want to do a little comparison <clears throat> that might help shed some light on the story. So I'm going to share my screen reluctantly because every time I do, there's a problem, but I'm going to try it. Okay, so here you can click on that link or just take a look. There we go. And let me make this big. There's our picture. Okay, so there's our time transfixed. Okay. Would you would you describe this picture as realistic? Remember back in the beginning of the first class, we said it kind of makes you feel like you're dreaming. Um, would you describe it as being realistic, or how would you describe it? Can everyone see the picture, or not? Yes, I see. Uh, okay, good. Okay, good, good, good. So, is the picture realistic? No, I think it is not realistic. It is well, sure what about, realistic. Well, yeah, but we have we don't know what that really means. But I'm saying, uh, look at the details in the picture. Do they seem realistic? Does it seem like uh, impressionism, or does it seem more like a photograph? 
Are there details? Every detail has a quite realistic trait, but right. on the four, it uh, of course it it looks uh, like surrealistic and realistic. It 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 looks like a dream. Okay, it looks like a dream. What do you think this picture means? A lot of people think we can interpret dreams. Freud certainly thought so. He wrote a book about it. The desire. <laughs> <laughs> so the Freudian interpretation would be that this is somehow sexual in meaning because you've got this phallic-looking train going through some kind of an opening in the the, the <laughs> chimney, right? Yes. So it might have a kind. This this could be the picture of a body because you've got the mirror, which is like symbolic of the eyes. You've got this train sticking out, which is kind of phallic. You've got two candlesticks, which represent the symmetry of the face. You've got a clock, which kind of represents the mouth. Somehow, this could be the picture of a body. Maybe it's symbolic of a body. But dreams often are interpreted as being symbolic. So um, let me ask you a question. The story that we read, did the, does that seem symbolic to you? Does the debutante seem symbolic? And if so, is it in any way similar to the way this is painted? Is there a, is there a similarity between the two? So let's start with question one. Does the debutante seem symbolic in any way? I I I I I have a feeling from this uh, and this short story, the debutante, uh, more fairy tale. Mm -hmm. it, it looks like a fairy tale, like uh, um, more than more than surrealistic description. Um, I don't know, maybe. Well, not 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 fairy tale, maybe it is it is cruel, quite cruel. So maybe oh. fairy tale for adults. Yeah, but why not? Why not fairy tale? Sure, why not? Because it has something supernatural. It's got an animal coming to life. It has a kind of fairy tale element, but it's different somehow. Let me ask you a question. This is for the group, right? You all can answer. Um, is the hyena symbolic of something in particular? If the hyena is more than just a character, what do you think the hyena symbolizes? What do you think? Anatoly, I know you like making guesses. I know you like speculating. Uh, hyena. Uh, There's no right or wrong answer. I have no idea. I'm just curious. I have a, I have a hunch, but I want to compare my hunch with yours. So... Mm -hmm. Does the hyena stand out as being symbolic more than just a character? Does it symbolize something? Maybe it is uh, uh, like a gadget <laughs> uh, tool. Oh uh, yeah. In what way? Uh, implement uh, for uh, people uh, who uh, didn't, uh, who uh, don't care about uh, consequences. Of, consequences, uh, yeah. Of uh, their actions. Good point. Remember, in the very beginning of the last story, we looked at some key words, and one of them was uh, unconscious. So we know that Freud popularized the idea of the unconscious mind, of all the things that uh, affect us emotionally that we're not aware of. So I agree with you, Anatoly. The the hyena seems to be the tool for this girl to do what she wants savagely, just to have no consequences for her actions. So that's kind of what I was getting at. The hyena seems to be symbolic of another part, another part of her personality, a hidden part that she's not allowed to act on, her impulses. Dare I say the... Um, it's the id, this the ego, and the superego. It's the id, isn't it? <laughs> this is the id. How many characters do we have in the story, by the way? Do you remember? How many characters? Four characters. Four. Mother. Mother. Mother Marie. Marie. Uh, 
the guard and hyena. And the hyena. And the bat. A bat. bat. And the bat. So five. And two of them are animals, and two of them are connected with, with the girl, the debutante, the bat and the hyena. And one of them acts out her secret impulses, and the other one warns her. Well, Yuki, you like Freud, so what does that tell you? I don't like Freud. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just that I deprived <laughs> of Freud. <laughs> but if you think about well, it, if you think about it like Freud, you would say, well, you've got a kind of a trinity. You've got a yes. three-part structure, just like Freud said. We have the superego controlling us. I, I, I did. I don't find uh, the sexual desire in this story, but I think uh, hyena is a symbol of rebellion uh, mm -hmm. and cruelty. Of the teenage, teenage, teenage girl. Uh, as I said, teenage girl has a two side of face. Uh, one is uh, naiveness, uh, yeah. awkward, uh, and maybe maybe kindness. I don't know. Mm, so maybe sensitivity. But uh, on the other hand, uh, they have a very um, very cruel. Cruel blood, <laughs> kind of de full of rebellion, uh, heart. Uh, um. Yeah, yeah, and isn't it interesting that the hyena goes to the party wearing the face of an innocent girl, so that everyone sees her, sees this innocent face, and only at the end does she do something. Uh, she acts like an animal, oh, except that she makes a declaration. So you've got this mask, but the mask is something real and living, <laughs> or was. Uh, and then you've got the real face to the hyena underneath it. You're going to tell me that's not sexual? Come on. See, she's got an she's got an appetite. She devours the maid. Seems kind of sexual to me, but I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm crazy. There with the hyena as well. Uh, she got something that human being. Uh... Uh, have uh, the, the 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 way of love, the way of love. I mean, uh, yeah, like it's it's like without any inhibition, right? Yeah. Hyenas laugh in this hysterical, almost frightening way. Yeah. Actually, we don't hear the laugh, do we? In the whole story, the hyena never laughs that I remember, does she? Never, but probably let's say at the time he went to the party or something like that. He didn't uh, talk or speak, but he probably laughed a little bit. Probably. This way, this way <laughs> of laughing might uh, attract people. Or in another sense, maybe the whole story is the sound of the laughing hyena. This uncontrolled, uncontrolled, in an inhibited kind of sound, like the text itself. Because it's the story of an impulse that's lived out. So. Uh, in any case, what I thought was interesting is that it looked like that picture we were looking at. You can read symbolism into the train if you want. And we could read symbolism into the hyena as well. The hyena seems to be the other part of the girl. She even wears the girl's face. So it, it seems to be that it's the two personalities together doing two different things. And then you've got the bat coming in and warning her. So fear, fear is what ends the story. As if that's the thing that, uh, remember the bat flies in. Why does the bat fly in through the window? Well, it kind of wakes her up and realizes, she realizes something bad is going to happen. So she's been living with no consequences. And suddenly, this thing that she's afraid of, you know, uh, breaks through the window. And she sort of snaps out of her dream. And that's when she has to face the consequences. Very interesting. I think here also a uh, uh, naiveness of uh, a teenager uh, appeared on the scene of uh, bat, bat entering en entering bat into the room. Uh, the girl are uh, uh, very afraid of the bat, but uh, before she she is not uh, reluctant to kill to help to kill her mate. So it too is uh, indeed there are two sides of face in teenagers. Uh, it 
uh, teenager, she, uh, it's the heart of teenager seeking for the, for the re rebellion, revolution, uh, cruelness, and uh, uh, at the same time, it, it's a very naive heart, uh, afraid, in, uh, which is afraid of every, every uh, shitty thing, very <laughs> ghost, <laughs> but... What's that, can't. sorry? Um, uh, last thing you said? Uh, uh, at the same time, teen, uh, teenagers are afraid of the very um, silly thing like ghosts. Oh, okay, uh, I got you. Uh, but like superstition or something. <laughs> but teacher. Okay, very good. Well, listen, we're going to read the second story. It's also pretty short. But one thing I'd like you to do is to get a sense of how stories like this are written. So, um, I'm going to show you the surrealist game, the parlor game they used to play, the game we talked about in the beginning of the first class called Exquisite Corpse. So right now on your screen you should see a little tutorial about how to play Exquisite Corpse. A corpse. Does everyone see Exquisite Corpse on your screen right now? Yes. You do. Yeah? Okay. okay, good, good. So this is taken from a website, but it's a good synopsis about how to play the game. Using writing games can be an excellent way of generating material. Okay, that's fine. Well, she doesn't mention that this is the original Surrealist game, but let's take a look at how to play. The game known as Exquisite Corpse comes in several versions. This one uses specific prompts. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, okay, this one is very pragmatic, actually. This is not what I want to find. What I want to find first is... Ah, I don't have time. Okay, never mind. We'll go with the... What they used to do is take a piece of paper and fold it. And that's kind of what it says here. So they'd all go to the cafe, drink their absinthe or whatever they used to do. They'd take a paper and fold it. And in each part of the paper, they'd have a word or sentence. But nobody could see the entire sentence. No one could see the entire text. They could only see part of the last text. In some cases, they might not see any of it because they kept folding the paper like origami. When they'd pass the paper around the room, they'd unfold it and they'd have a story. Or if they were drawing, they'd have a finished drawing. And this unexpected, um, this unexpected aspect was what they were looking for. A way to create mystery, a way to get at something deeper than the conscious mind was capable of. So, we're going to try to do it right now. The prompts. It says, write down an article definite or indefinite, any adjective, write down a concrete noun, write down an adverb, and write down one of the following verbs, okay? We're going to take, we're going to see if we can create a sentence using the exquisite corpse technique, okay? So here's what we're going to try to do. We'll see how it works with our little group. Um, we've got five people here right now. Other people are watching, but they left or they're coming back, I don't know. So I'm going to assign a part of speech to each of you, and I'm going to ask you to use the group chat to post inside the, the Google chat. But I'm going to tell you to do it at the same time, because I don't want you to see anyone else's words. So we all have to post at the same time. So, Ahmed, you're going to choose an article, a definite or indefinite article, or a determiner. Any word that comes before a noun, okay? Okay. Don't tell us which one it is. Uh, uh, Anatoly, you're going to come up with an adjective for us, a word that describes a noun, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Anatoly, no, sorry, that's you. Uh, Anton, you're going to come up with a concrete noun. That's a noun that names something physical, something that is real in the world. Nothing abstract. Okay? Okay. Okay? Yuki, you're going to come up with an adverb, a word that describes how something happened. Adverbs usually have L-Y at the end. All right? Any, any verb is okay. Any, not verb, any adverb. Adverb, okay. Any adverb. And finally, I'm going to write... Um, I'm going to write a verb, okay? So when I say go, 
you're going to write your words in the group chat and we're going to try to play exquisite corpse to come up with a an exquisite corpse automatic writing sentence is everyone ready everyone ready i am ready i am ready ready anton ready yes. okay on the count of 3 1 2 3 go paste <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Who are we missing? We've got four. We've got five people. Who are we missing? Uh, I wrote in the. Uh, oh, the chat. Chat. oh, put it, put it in the, uh, put it in the group chat. Okay. If you don't mind, put it in the group chat. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. 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 Oh. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's see. If we can put this in order. Um, first is the article, and then is the adjective. So Anne, Anne, beautiful. Next is the noun, house. Uh, then Yuki said unexpectedly, and then I said remembers. Oh, look at that! Look at our sentence. And beautiful house unexpectedly remembers. Congratulations, everyone. You just came up with your first surrealist story. And beautiful house unexpectedly remembers. What do you think? Do you like it? No. And collage. collage. <laughs> it's not it's grammatically exactly correct. Okay, okay. It's not grammatically correct. A beautiful house. A beautiful house unexpectedly remembers. Okay, we'll change and to a. And to a, uh, then it'll be grammatically correct. It's still pretty good. I like it. It's very poetic. So I'll just get rid of the n. For you grammar people out there, a beautiful house unexpectedly remembers. Wow, I like that. That's a good opening line. Whoever can create the rest of the story wins a cookie. Okay, that's your homework. <laughs> that is your homework. Okay, let's read the second story. And then we'll, we'll compare them both. Um, here it is on screen. White Rabbits by Leonore Carrington. This is also really short. Um, let's go from left to right, starting with Ahmed. Okay. White Rabbits by Leonora Carrington. The time has come that I must tell the events which began in 40 Best Street. Uh, the houses which were reddish black looked as if they had survived mysteriously from the fire of London. The That's house the fire that burned down the city, right? That's the famous fire of London. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Famous historical event when the city burned to the ground, just about. The house in front of my window, covered with an occasional wisp of creeper, was as creeper black. are like vines, like ivy going up the side. Ivy. Uh, I don't know what it Just is. Just so it's clear. Insect. Creeper is. No, no. Creeper is ivy. Ivy. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Green uh, leafy uh, plants. Yeah, yeah. It is like I don't know. Yeah, leaves. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Like climbing uh, leaves, something like that. That's right. Mm. Climbing leaves. Creeper. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, was as blank and empty looking as any pla plague 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 ridden resident re resi resi residents subsequently licked by flames and sal salived with smoke. This is not the way that I had imagined New York. Okay, what? that's a little difficult to understand. So, just to be clear, there's a house with ivy on the side, but it looked blank, plague-ridden. Plague-ridden means touched or attacked by plague. Plague is disease. Plague is disease. Clear? It has something to do with the teeth? No, 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 no. Plague. Plague means disease. Ah, okay. Plague-ridden means something that was full of disease. Full of disease. So the house was blank and empty looking, just like any yeah. residence, just like any house. Yeah. 
that had been licked by flames. In other words, she's comparing the fire to something that has a tongue and licks lick with flames. And saliva, that's the liquid in your mouth, saliva, salived with smoke. Licked with flames and salived with smoke. So it's a very unusual description of a house, in short. Uh, this uh, described to, uh, I mean, uh, describing uh, like something miserable. Pretty miserable, and also that it had survived this fire. It appears it had somehow mysteriously survived a fire. Mm. So it's an unusual house. Keep going. Okay. Uh, it was so hot that I got palpitations when I ventured out into the streets. So I sat and considered the house opposite and occasionally bathed or bathed, bathed my sweating face. Sweating. Right. Sweating face. Sweating face. Palpitations is when your heart doesn't beat right. Mm. Like when your heart skips a beat you have, or beats too fast, you have palpitations. Mm -hmm. So not only does the house seem a little sick, she seems a little sick because it's so hot. Her heart is beating too fast, right? And she's bathed <coughs> by her own sweat. Okay, keep going. Okay. The draft <coughs> was never very strong in the street. There was always a remin Rem reminiscence. reminiscence of smoke which made visibility, visibility troubled and hazy. Still, it was possible to study the house opposite carefully. Even precisely besides my eyes have always been excellent. All right, very good. So, I know that's a little bit difficult with the vocabulary. Any questions about the vocabulary so far? Is everything kind of clear, more or less? Hazy. Hazy is the same as foggy. Mm -hmm. okay. Hazy is the same as foggy, particularly if there's smoke. Okay. Remi Reminiscence. 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 Reminiscence is the conscious act of remembering. To reminisce is to consciously think about the past. Okay. So there was always a reminiscence of smoke. In other words, it's as if reality is living and, and remem remembering the past. So there's some kind of memory of smoke. Remember, this is very poetic language, so it's never going to be 100% clear. But you get a picture of disease, of fire, of heat in this house in New York. Or in the house in London, sorry. But she said, this is not what I imagined. This is not how, this is not the way that I had imagined New York. So we have to figure out where she is. <laughs> okay, Anatoly, why don't you take the next paragraph? Okay. I uh, spent uh, several days watching for some sort of movement opposite, uh, uh, but there was none, and I finally uh, took to understand, uh, to and uh, undressing quite freely before my open window, and uh, doing breathing exercise optimistically in the thick past street air. This must uh, have uh, uh, blackened uh, my lungs as dark as the houses. One afternoon I washed my hair and uh, set out on the diminutive uh, stone uh, crescent uh, which served as a balcony to dry it. I hung my head between my knees and uh, uh, watched a blue bottle suck in the dry course of a spider between my feet. I looked up... Sorry, my... just to make sure that it's clear. I watched a blue bottle suck dry the corpse of a spider. 
Can you even picture that? <laughs> it's a little hard to visualize. A blue bottle sucked dry the corpse of a spider between my feet. Mm -hmm. Does that does that make sense? Uh, not completely. <laughs> not not to me either. <clears throat> so somehow she's drying hair and she's looking down and she sees a blue bottle, and somehow that blue bottle is taking all of the insides of a spider out, drying out the spider between her feet. Uh. It's weird. Mm -hmm. If you understand it, you can explain it to me, Anatoly, because I don't understand it either. Mm. Uh, I I can imagine blue bottle and uh, dry uh, corpse of a spider inside this blue bottle, and maybe yeah, okay. this person maybe that's it. Uh, hold uh, held uh, it uh, uh, between his feet. Right. Probably it's a her because the way she's describing drying her hair it sounds like she has long hair, and ah, okay. this is an old story. Probably it's a her. Okay, keep going, Anatoly. Let's see what happens. I looked up through my uh, length hair and uh, saw something black in the sky, ominously quiet for an airplane. Airplane. Uh, parting my hair, I was in time to see a large raven. Uh, a light. A light, right? A light. A light on the uh, balcony of the house opposite. It sat on the uh, balustrade and seemed to peer into the empty window, then uh, poked its head under its wing, apparently searching for uh, lice. A few minutes later, I was not unduly uh, surprised to see. The, dub, uh, the double uh, windows open and uh, admit a woman onto the balcony. She carried a large a dish full of bones which sh uh, she uh, emptied, emptied onto the floor. Uh, with a short appreciative, uh, uh, appreciative uh, squawk, uh, the raven hoped down and picked out uh, amongst its unpleasant past. Okay, so let's just recap, Anatoly. What scene does she see when she's drying her hair? Let's just put this in plain English. What does she see? Uh, so she uh, saw a woman and yeah. a raven. And, and what she, what's the woman doing to the raven? Mm. Uh -huh. uh, uh, why why, uh, she, uh, why she she maybe she, the she fed uh, she uh, fed the raven. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the woman is feeding bones to the was raven. Was feeding uh, raven. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a weird scene, I suppose. And she's watching all of this at the balcony across the street. So she's mm -hmm. drying her hair <clears throat> with her corpse spider, and she sees the, the raven being fed bones. Okay, very good. Uh, well, Anatoly, why don't you continue to the bottom of the page then? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the woman uh, who had uh, temp long uh, black hair whipped out the dish using uh, her hair for this purpose. Uh, uh, then she uh, looked uh, straight at me and smiled in a friendly fashion. I smiled back and uh, waved the towel. Uh, this uh, seemed to encourage her, for she tossed, uh, tossed uh, her head uh, coquettishly, coquettishly uh, and, and gave me a very elegant uh, salute after the fashion of a queen. Do you happen to have any uh, bad meat over there that you don't need? She called. And what? I called back, wondering 
if my ears had deceived me. <laughs> you know how neighbors ask each other for rotten meat? You know, that's what happens. Okay. <clears throat> the word the word coquettish. Is that clear okay. what that means? Coquettish. Yes, yes, we have the same uh, pronunciation uh, with uh, the same pronunciation word in okay. my language. So, mm -hmm. the word so the word is another word would be what? Uh, what's, a, what's a simpler word? Maybe playing, uh, maybe uh, showing uh, gracefully. Well, the key word here is flirtatious. Flirtatious, provocative. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can be playful, but there's a certain flirt, flirtatious element to it. So there's something suggestive there. It's not just <clears throat> not just playful, flirtatious, as if you want something more than you're letting on. Okay, so Anton, let's take it from the top of the next page. Mm. Any stinking meat, decomposed fl uh, flesh meat. Not at the moment, I replied, wondering if she was trying to be funny. Won't you have any towards the end of the week? If so, I would be very uh, grateful if you would bring it over. Then she stepped back into the empty window and disappeared. The raven flew away. My curiosity about the house and its occupant prompted me to buy a large, lu a large lump of meat the following uh, day. I set it on the balcony on a bit of newspaper and awaited developments. You know, in a comparatively short time, the smell was so strong that I was ob obliged uh, to pursue my daily activities with a paper clip on the end of my nose. Occasionally, I descended into the street to breathe. Towards uh, Thursday evening, I noticed uh, that the meat was changing color. So waving aside a flight of numerous um, blue bottles, I scooped it into my sponge bag and set out for the house opposite. I noticed descending the stair that the landlady seemed to avoid me. It took me some time to find the front door of the house opposite. I wonder why, I wonder why the landlady was avoiding you if you smelled like rancid meat. Mm. That's a rhetorical question. Don't worry. Okay. It, it turned out to be hidden under a cascade of smutty, smutty ivy, giving the impression that nobody had been either in or out of this house for years. The bell was of the old-fashioned kind that you pull, uh, pull and pulling it harder than I intended. It came right off in my hand. I gave the door an angry, angry push, and it caved inwards, emitting a ghastly smell of put, putrid putrid woodwork. putrid woodwork. Putrid means rotten, decomposing, putrid. So the wood of the house is rotten, and it, it comes right off. <clears throat> Who lives in this house? Who do you think lives in this house? And why does she want rotten meat? What do you think, Anton? Who is this person? If you had to make a guess at this point, what would you say? Mm. Any ideas? No guess. <laughs> okay. Does anyone want to make a guess? Who is this person? And what do you think she wants with the meat? Anyone want to make a guess? Yeah, maybe she's a reaper. She's, she's death. A, she's death. Oh, she's the grim reaper. <laughs> I don't but, know. Or devil. What does? She, what do you think she's gonna do with the rotten meat? What does she want with it? She she gives the rotten meat to to the raven. I don't know because she no, gives she gives, she gives the bones. Yeah. She gives the bones to the raven. Ah. Oh. So what does she want the rotten meat for? I don't know. I have no idea either. Hmm. Uh, 
Ahmed, what do you think is going to happen when the girl enter, when the woman enters the house to give the meat? What do you think is going to happen? Hmm. <laughs> what? Something mysterious. Huh? Something? Something? <laughs> I said mysterious. There is mystery here. There is a lot of mystery. Mm. Anatoly, do you think that something bad is going to happen to our protagonist? Mm. I expect an <laughs> uh, unhappy end. You expect an unhappy ending? Really? I don't. I think that she and the other woman are going to find out they have a lot in common. That's my feeling. I think they're going to become best friends. You don't think so? We're going to find out in just a minute. Okay, let's pick it up from the second half of page seven. Yuki? Okay. Uh, the, wo the woman, yeah? Yep. The woman herself came, uh, came rustling rust down the stairs carrying a torch. How do you do? How do you do? She, mam she murmured ceremoniously, and I was surprised to no notice that she wore an ancient and beautiful dress of green silk. But as she approached me, I saw that, that her skin was dead, dead white, and glittered as though speckled, speckled with, the, with thousands of minute stars. Isn't, isn't that the kind of you? She went on, taking my arm with her sparkling hand. Won't my poor little rabbit be pre pleased? We, we, mounted, we, mo we mounted the stair stairs and my companion walked so carefully that I thought she was frightened. The top flight of the top flight of stars opened opened into the boudoir. 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 Boudoir is a uh, uh, bedroom, yeah. For yeah. French, a uh, boudoir decorated with dark bar baroque dark baroque uh, furniture and red plush, and the floor was. Uh, Floor was littered with gnawed bones and gnawed. animals. Gnawed. A gnawed. There's no G. There's no G. Gnawed bone. Littered with, littered with gnawed bones and animal skulls. It's, it's so seldom that we, we get a visit, smiled the woman. So they all scuttle off into their little corners. She uttered a, a low whistle and transfixed. Uh, I saw about, about a hundred snow white rabbits emerge cautiously cautious, cautious, from every nook. Their large pink eyes fixed unwinkledly uh, upon the <laughs> woman. Not an easy word. Unwinkingly. Unwinkingly. I'm, I'm winkingly upon the woman. All um, right. So, wait, so tell me, what's unusual about the, how this woman looks? Is she uh, the woman we expected to see? No, it is uh, unexpected to guest <laughs> come to her. What's, a, what's, what's unusual about the way she looks? Remember the, the description about her skin? Yes, skin. Uh, uh, firstly, it smells. Remember the word? Mm, uh, uh, her skin was dead, dead white. Uh, and? And glittered as though speckled thousands of minutes. Start. So many stars, uh, it dotted, yeah? Yes. Glittered oh, is glitter. dotted with little flecks of light. Glittered. Glitter. Glittered with, or speckled. With little lights, yeah? 
That's right. Mm -hmm. So she's got little shiny things all yes, over it... her skin. <laughs> so she looks uh, unusual, of course. Uh, yes. Uh, she looks like a 1970s disco queen because she's got <laughs> glitter all over her. I don't know what she looks yes. like. I have no idea. Yes. I have no idea. Um, let me just see where we are here. Hold on. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, no problem. Well, we're going to go over here. time a little bit, but okay. it's a short story. So, And rabbits, of course. Okay, so back to Ahmed, up to here. Go for it. Go ahead, Ahmed. Okay, okay. Sorry, because <laughs> I was unmuted. Okay. Come pretty ones. Come pretty ones. She could. Diving her hand into my sponge bag and pulling out a handful of rotting meat. With a sensation of deep disgust, I backed into a corner and saw her throwing the carrion among the rabbits, which fought like wolves for it. <laughs> One becomes very. You know, this is what you do when you've got guests over. You throw rotten meat at your bunnies. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One becomes very fond of them. The woman went on. They each have their little ways. You would be surprised how very individual rabbits are. The rabbits in question were tearing at the meat with their sharp back. We eat them, of course, occasionally. My husband makes a very tasty stew every Saturday night. Then a movement in the corner caught my attention, and I realized that there was a third pers person in the room. As the woman's torch light touched his face, I saw he had glittering skin, like ten... Tinsel? Tinsel. 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 Uh, on a Christmas tree. He was dressed in a red gown and sat very rigidly with his profile there turned towards us. He seemed to So be what do you notice what do you notice about the, the woman and the man? They seem to match, don't they? Yeah. They seem to match in a funny way. They're both glittering. So, yeah, have, uh, they're, they're both glittering? Both have, yeah, they both have glittering skin. Right, and they both have gowns? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, gowns? Her gown was and red, What about I the guess. colors? I, Her sure. gown was green, and his gown is red. Ah. And they're both wearing these silk gowns. Hers is green, and his is red. Mm -hmm. So, does that... Does that tell you anything about them? <laughs> it sounds like a funny Christmas story because they, they're wearing glitter. They're described like tinsel in a Christmas tree and they're wearing green and red, kind of like the color of a Christmas tree. It sounds like they're little, they're yeah. little funny elves with lots mm -hmm. of rabbits. I don't know. It just mm. kind of reminds me of that. Yeah, it, uh, All right. I don't know, but uh, it seems We're, a little bit like, what, like Wonderland. A little bit like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were there were rabbits in Alice in Wonderland too. Mm. <laughs> there were there was a crazy there was the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, the one who was always very. It looks like Beetlejuice in the film. Have you heard? Have you watched Beetlejuice? Tim Burton, directed by. Yeah. He's uh, maybe first debut debut film as a director maybe, not not a debut. Ali um, one of the Ali his his work yes. Uh, I it remains Only it, film that it he did reminds that me actually. of Beetlejuice, <laughs> not Ali <Alice> in <laughs> Wonderland. <laughs> Could be because of the way also the way that uh that um. It's something Michael funny Keaton but looked. awful. It's awful, but something funny. Also because of the way Michael Keaton looks in the movie. He's like kind of rotting. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Such a rotten symbol 
often appeared in his film. Well, a Anatoly, let's take it. We're, we got just enough for two more readers. So, Anatoly, let's pick it up with He Seemed. We're looking at the guy in the red gown. Okay. Uh, he seemed uh, to be an unconscious of our presence as that of a large buck rabbit uh, which sat uh, masticating a chunk of meat on his knee. Uh, the woman followed my gaze and chuckled. That uh, is my husband. The boys used to call him Lazarus. Uh, at the sound of this uh, familiar name, uh, he turned his face toward us, and uh, I saw that he wore a bandage over his eyes. Ethel, he inquired. Ethel. Ethel. Ethel, he inquired in a rather thin voice. I won't have any visitors here. You know quite well that I have uh, forbidden it strictly. Uh, now, uh, Lars, don't start carrying on. Her voice was uh, plaintive. Uh, you can uh, grudge me in a little bit a uh, company. It's twenty odd years since I've seen a new face. Besides, she's brought meat for the rabbits. Who is Lazarus? In the Bible, uh, her husband. No, but in the Bible, in the Bible, who is Lazarus? Uh, I don't remember. In the New Testament of the Bible, does anyone remember? Ah, uh, she is uh, uh, the uh, the 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 in this last Christian, uh, the 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 this uh, how to say the uh, revived, yeah. He he comes he, back. He comes back. Yes. <laughs> Right, yes. Lazarus yes. Uh, when, is the guy. When when the Jesus uh, uh, came into the cave, uh, he uh, uh, Lazaro uh, revived and he came out. Right, so from so the what, cave. he's the one that Jesus brings back from the dead. One of the miracles yes. in the Bible. So Lazarus is always the one who returns in some way. So it gives us the idea that her husband somehow. <laughs> He's kind of a zombie or something. Gives us this strange idea. Um, and also, what about this? It's been 20 odd years since I've seen a new face. My God, what have they been doing for the last 20 years? They never have any company. No wonder they're kind of weird and sparkly. They haven't really gotten out much. Well, Anton, you're going to take it to the bottom of the page and to the end of the story. Actually, we have a little bit of text on the second page. Let's find out how our story ends. Anton? She turns and beckoned me to her side. You want to stay with us? Do you not, my dear? I was suddenly clutched by fear and I wanted to get out and away from those terrible silver people and the white... Uh, Carnivorous. Can Carnivorous rabbits. I think I must be going. It is supper time. The man on the chair gave a shrill peal of laughter to refine the rabbit on his knee, which sprang uh, to the floor and disappeared. Keep going. Uh, the woman uh, thrust her face so near to mine that her sickly breath seemed to anesthetize me. Anesthetize me. Do not want to stay and become like us. I stumbled and ran, choking with horror. Some unholy curiosity made me look over my shoulder as I reached the front door, and I saw her waving her hand over the banister. And as uh, as she waved, her fingers fell off and dropped to the ground like shooting stars. Boom. <laughs> And that's the story of the White Rabbit. Happy story? This <laughs> 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 weird. <laughs> not the ending you were expecting, Ahmed? Uh, no, not that. But I mean, 
uh, you know, I, uh, I tried to imagine every single scene. I couldn't, really. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but look at look at the look at the um, look at the uh, what's the word the the motifs of the story. Um, there's this idea of it's a mix of some some kind of uh, awful story and sentimental and funny story. Some mix. It it really reminds me of the Tim Burton the film. <laughs> One thing. I, but look, one thing I wanted just to point out was look at this mo look at this motif at the end of shooting stars, right? She, as she waved, <laughs> she, she's not running after her, right? As she waved, her fingers fell off and dropped to the ground like shooting stars. And earlier, we saw that her skin and her husband's skin was speckled like a million minute stars. And before that, we saw something shooting across the sky that was unusual, too quiet to be an airplane. It seems to me, and then even before that, we had the idea of this memory of fire. Um, I can't help but think there's a connection there between all these elements. Um, on one hand, I'm reminded of the story of Icarus, who flew too close to the sun, and I keep seeing all these elements of fire and falling, and it makes me wonder if that isn't part of it. I don't know why, but it just reminds me of that. On the other hand, I've got this idea of falling and descent. And tell me, if you agree with me on this, tell me if this is not the story of fallen people. Because when a star falls to the ground, the shooting star, right, we have this symbolic idea of descent. And we meet these people who are literally look like walking dead, right? They've got dead skin and they're pale, and one of them seems to be Lazarus, and they're around rotting meat, <laughs> and they've got very bad social skills, and they're literally falling apart. Their hands or fingers are falling to the ground. So it seems that this has got something to do with the falling stars seem to symbolize somehow the descent of I don't know, mankind, and where somehow this is a story of the descent. But I don't really know what it means, but I just can't help thinking about that. What do you think? Am I on to something, or am I way off? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> They're in shock. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, uh, for me it uh, demonstrates the uh, next example which you show it as uh, when we uh, put uh, together randomly uh, chosen <laughs> words <laughs> in one sentence. Yeah, but that's, that's how they wrote many of their stories. They began with different elements and no one knew the whole story. So it's very possible that that was part of her technique. It's possible. Mm -hmm. Or it could have started as that, and then she could have developed it further, right? Or something like that. So absolutely, because the beginning seems somehow out of place in a way, right? The beginning is this talk of fire and, uh, and this memory of smoke and fire and things like that. And then she goes outside, and it's, the story is totally different because it's got nothing to, at least I don't see a connection, except this vague connection with shooting stars and fire, right? It seems to be like a totally different element or something like that. So yeah, it could be an exquisite corpse story uh, that then she developed and published. But that doesn't mean it's random for no reason. The purpose of exquisite corpse was to get below the surface, right? To try to reinvigorate mystery. So we're forced trying to understand what the story means, and that is part of the purpose, probably, I would say. That there's this constant mystery that forces us to make connections. The connections we make are just as interesting as the story itself. Like one thing I can't help but but think about is the colors. Uh, Green silk, red silk, blue bottles, sparkles, all of those colors stand out, especially against the decrepit people 
and the burned buildings. So it's very vivid for me. What do you think about that? What do you think the blue bottles, what, what is that about? The blue bottles everywhere. She keeps talking about blue bottles. Does that stand out for anyone? And also, they both, they both are described, their hair is a, is a detail that stands out. The woman has hemp long black hair and she also her hair is <coughs> lank hair right so it's, hair seems to be very important here as well and then we've got all these animals <laughs> again uh, with the animals here is uh, always uh, used in the horror story uh, because hair reminds me the reminds me of the woman, uh, sometimes dead woman, <laughs> sometimes awful, awful, uh, awful image of woman, maybe med medius. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and also, her hair is lank, so does that mean that her hair is long and beautiful? Lank. Her hair is described as lank. Mm. Uh, so. Long hair is often is the main motif of many horror story. Uh, I think I think it uh, it it makes us the imagination of the uh, uh, beautiful woman and the smell of death. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I think uh, it such a such a color, use of color of this story uh, reminds us of the sentimental uh, oh, um, allows allows us uh, uh, feeling of sentimental feeling. Uh, so In what way? In what way? Sentimental. Sentimental. So, uh, what is uh, in factually what is happened in this story is is just awful. Yeah, <laughs> pretty Death, much. Death, awful meat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, so very curious characters and um, killing um, something, killing thing. But uh, but. Uh, um, I expected to be, uh, be, be um, it uh, such a kind of sentimental sentimental feeling, uh, naive feeling, uh, and humorous uh, uh, is uh, or um, we can feel such a humorous and sentimental feeling in this story all the time when I read it. So it. I think uh, every item used in this story and the color uh, make us such a feeling. L let me just interrupt for a second. Um, if we want to talk about this story, uh, I can reserve another class if you want. If you want to stick around for, for a little bit more time because we're 20 minutes over. So if you want to come back, I'll reserve a class and I'll restart it. If you've got to go, let me know, and I won't. What do you think? I uh, yeah yeah. Will you be I, around? I'd be glad to. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well if I've got one, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so because I'm going over time a lot, and I'm really not supposed to do that. So let me stop this class now. I'm going to start the second hour in 30 seconds, and just come back in, and we'll 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 finish our discussion. Okay? So I'll be back in just a moment. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank so, you very much. hope to see you in thank just a minute. You. Thank, thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.